Track 4. Brasenose College. Brasenose is a significant site in the story of Wilde's time in Oxford, as one of the Classics fellows here was none other than Walter Pater, an important figure in Wilde's intellectual development and one of the leaders of Oxford's aesthetic movement. Is that a what? Aestheticism, my dear Ernest, was an artistic movement that prioritised aesthetic values in the arts. Aesthetes like Pater promoted a cult of beauty, which they believed was the primary purpose of art. Art was for art's sake, and life should imitate art. The year before Wilde came up to Oxford, Pater published his collection of essays, Studies in the History of the Renaissance, complete with a brief but controversial conclusion. Pater's greatest hits provoked criticism from conservative quarters as it appeared to advocate pagan pleasure-seeking and amorality. To burn always with this hard, gem-like flame, to maintain this ecstasy, is success in life. Wilde could quote with ease much of Pater's book, especially its conclusion. He called it My Golden Book and described it as the book which has had such a strange influence over my life. In Wilde's one and only novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray, Lord Henry encourages the young hero to lead a hedonistic lifestyle, in words that echo Pater's conclusion. There is no such thing as a good influence, Mr. Gray. All influence is immoral. Immoral from the scientific point of view. Why? Because to influence a person is to give him one's own soul. He does not think his natural thoughts or burn with his natural passions. His virtues are not real to him. His sins, if there are such things as sins, are borrowed. He becomes an echo of someone else's music, an actor of a part that has not been written for him. The aim of life is self-development. To realise one's nature perfectly, that is what each of us is here for. People are afraid of themselves nowadays. They have forgotten the highest of all duties, the duty that one owes to oneself. I believe that if one man were to live out his life fully and completely, were to give form to every feeling, expression to every thought, reality to every dream, I believe that the world would gain such a fresh impulse of joy that we would forget all the maladies of medievalism and return to the Hellenic ideal, to something finer, richer than the Hellenic ideal it may be. The year after Studies in the History of the Renaissance was published, Pater was turned down for a routine promotion to the post of University Proctor. It used to be believed that Pater was snubbed on account of his contentious publication. However, the truth of the matter is actually more scandalous. Oh, do tell. The snubbing of Pater can be traced back to one man on Pater's own doorstep. Who? This suspense is terrible. I hope it will last. None other than Joet himself. Joet? Oh, I knew it. But why? Joet had found out that Pater had sent letters signed Yours lovingly to an undergraduate named William Money Hardinge, a friend of a good friend of Wilde's at Balliol, J.E.C. Bodley. Hardinge had earned himself such an infamous reputation for his indecency in speech and behaviour that he became known as the Balliol Bugger. When the Classics tutor at Balliol, R. L. Nettleship, failed to take any action to stop the brewing storm, one of Wilde's close friends, Leonard Montefiore, made a formal complaint to Joet, the master of the college, in early 1876. Joet was told about the Pater letters and given copies of supposedly homosexual sonnets by Hardinge as evidence of his blasphemy and impiety. The scandalised Joet ceased contact with Pater and summoned Hardinge. Do you deny that you are guilty of keeping and reciting immoral poetry? I dispute the description of it as immoral, but I cannot deny that the verse is mine. Very well. You have two choices. You will either be sent down, quietly, or face an official proctorial inquiry. In that case, I choose to be sent down. Joet wrote to Hardinge's father, informing him that his son was living here in a way which might ultimately harm himself, and was already throwing discredit on his college. His conversation and writings are indecent, his acquaintance bad, his work equals not squared. Why should he remain at Oxford? Hardinge's father could only agree. 
The only problem was that Hardinge had won the prestigious Newdigate Prize for his poem on Helen of Troy. Normally, the Newdigate winner would recite the successful composition in the Sheldonian Theatre at the June Insania, the ceremony conferring honorary degrees. Hardinge, however, had to graciously accept that he was too ill to return, an excuse that Wilde's friend Bodley at least pretended to accept. And the Sheldonian is our next destination, dear listener. To get there, we must go back to Broad Street. Simply go around the domed Radcliffe camera and turn left up Catt Street. That's C-A-T-T-E. When you get to Broad Street, turn left. And keep going until you come to a building fronted by the busts of Roman emperors. This is the Sheldonian Theatre, the second work of the great English architect Sir Christopher Wren.